then you get again to the $300 range for silver. It sounds sensational, uh, but if you're looking a few years in the future, if you look at what silver has done in the past and how it relates to gold and inflation, I think it's actually a very realist realistic target. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. 31 years strong, A plus rated by the Better Business Bureau. Zero complaints, licensed and bonded. For physical delivery, vault storage, or precious metals IRAs, excellent prices, privacy, and confidentiality. Pay by check, money order, ACH, bank wire, or Bitcoin. Satisfaction guaranteed. For fastest service, Service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY, that's 888-81-LIBERTY, and either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with LibertyAndFinance.com, and with us today is Peter Kraut from SilverStockInvestor.com. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello Elijah, it's a pleasure and uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, well, it's great to have you here for the first time. Uh, what I'd really like to discuss today is financial repression, what it is and how it's impacting us today, because this impacts pretty much anybody who is in the, the country that it is happening, right? And you have to strategically invest to avoid the negative impact of it. So your perspective on that, if you could expand on what financial repression is and how it's impacting us today. Sure, sure, thanks. So, um, you know, financial repression in a very simple sense is uh, when uh, a central bank keeps interest rates purposely low while they allow inflation to run unchecked. But if you don't mind, what I'd like to do is read um, a portion of, um, of, a dis of, a, um, of a definition of financial repression, which comes directly from Investopedia. And I just think it, you know, it's useful for people to kind of hear um, how someone like that, uh, you know, puts, the, puts this term. So they define it as measures by which governments channel funds from the private sector to themselves as a form of debt reduction. The overall policy actions result in the government being able to borrow at extremely low interest rates, obtaining low cost funding for government expenditures. This action also results in savers earning rates, than, uh, rates less than the rate of inflation and is therefore repressive. So that really says it all. <laughs> How does that impact the average person? Well, so the average person, I'll, I'll give you an example. If you look at a, at a 10 year treasury, it's yielding about 1.6% right now, uh, maybe a little bit less in fact. And if you uh, um, subtract from that, the, the recent inflation rate, so the last 12 month inflation rate, which is up at 6.2 um, for the US, uh, that leaves you with, uh, my math is right, 4.8, I believe, or I'm not, uh, just roughly about 4.8% uh, net uh, loss. So you're in it. You you're actually on a 10-year treasury. You have a negative yield uh, when you subtract inflation. So investors, savers are are way behind, um, even though they've spent years, you know, uh, doing everything right, putting lots of uh, money aside, sacrificing in the meantime, and and the way things are are playing out right now, they're actually falling behind um, by investing and receiving, um, you know, say a 1.6 percent, and that's actually a pretty decent rate. If you go to a regular savings account, you're lucky if you get anywhere close to 1%. It's probably closer to half a percent, if that. So, um, so in fact, uh, net of inflation, a savings account will pay you considerably less even. So what it does is it forces investors to look elsewhere. Uh, and I think that's you know a large part of the goal. It forces investors to look for other ways of earning returns. It, it pushes them towards stocks. It pushes them towards real estate. We've seen um, the effects of that in the last, say, decade or so. Stocks are near all-time highs. Real estate is up about 40% in the last two years. And so it basically helps to inflate bubbles. But as we know, bubbles tend to pop. And when they do, it gets messy. And uh, 
you know, people people end up uh, losing dramatically. We saw this back in the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, people walked away from their homes, mailed the keys back to the bank, and um, it, and it certainly ruined a lot of uh, a lot of retirements. So again, um, you know, investors need to look for ways alternates to uh, to the stocks, real estates, and even bonds these days. Um, and certainly, precious metals are are uh, a place to uh, to look for for a safe haven. They always have been in in high inflation um, scenarios, and this is not going to be any exception. That's for sure. And what do you think the Fed is going to do in this situation? Because it seems like we have been living under financial repression for quite a long time. And now they're looking to um, be a bit more hawkish, possibly, because we're seeing inflation at, you know, the 30 here high. And we're expecting on Friday even a higher inflation rate. So your perspective on what the Fed, how the Fed will react to this. So. So um, I, I read a, a headline recently that kind of uh, puts it uh, all into perspective in, in just a few words. And it was something along, along the lines of uh, Powell is buying time and he's stalling. And I certainly see it that way. Um, yes, there is. There's often talk there's and there's rarely action that to back up that talk. Um, we see them talk about raising rates. It's it's. You know, they're, 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 they've been talking about uh, tapering. That may well uh, take place. It may well be even accelerated and may end earlier than, say, mid next year. But that's not the same as raising rates. Uh, that's uh, sort of s- slowing down. Really, all that doing that's doing is slowing down added liquidity. Uh, but raising rates, if it happens sometime next year, uh, the way I see it, uh, there's just so much that depends um, there's so much debt that depends on low rates to be able to service that debt. Today, we're starting at a point with rates at zero, essentially. So it, the forecast is the Fed's been saying for some time that they would raise rates in, say, early 2023. There's been some talk more recently because um, infl- inflation's been high and there's pressure on them to start fighting inflation potentially. So now there's some talk uh, that they may raise rates earlier, uh, say mid to late 2022. But let's remember that they're starting from a point of zero rates practically right now. So even if they do start raising rates, I see that being very slow, very gradual. It could take them a year, a year and a half to get from maybe zero to one, one and a half percent. And uh, I see some resistance from from the stock market, even for that. Let's not forget the U.S. has uh, almost 30 trillion in debt. Worldwide global debt is three, almost 300 trillion dollars. The global money supply is up five times in the last 20 years. So it, between governments, um, individuals and businesses, debt levels are so high. Uh, I, th- I think long term rates are going to be short and long term rates are going to be held low purposely uh, for for a very long time. It's possible that, you know, the market tends to determine long term rates. The Fed has control over short term rates. But um, they have tools for that as well. So if you'd like, we can we can talk about about that a little bit and but and what that might look like. A lot of people have been pointing out how the Fed seems to possibly be trapped because if they do raise rates, the market crashes. And if they don't, then we continue to see the highest inflation we've seen for 30 years. So what kind of tools do does the Fed actually have at this moment? So we, if we can back up for a quick second, uh, you made an interesting point that, you know, rates are low, they'll they likely be kept quite low for some time and yet inflation is running rampant. And frankly, I think that's the goal. Um, because as we were saying earlier, if uh, under financial repression, if you keep rates low and you allow inflation to run, that devalues the currency and it allows debts to be paid back in the future uh, from much cheaper dollars. So it, it's, it ends up being mission accomplished essentially uh, because of that. But um, so if we look at, uh, I was saying earlier that Um, Long-term rates technically are not controlled by the Fed, but they do have a tool. And um, 
Bernanke, Yellen, and Powell have also have all said that uh, they'd be open to using something called yield curve control. And so yield curve control is uh, influencing uh, bonds on the long end. So longer term bonds could be influenced by the Fed saying, okay, well, uh, you know, we see those rates getting too high. We'd like to peg them at a certain level. And so if um, if they get too high, we'll start buying to put pressure and bring down the rates like they're like they're doing right now with um, with uh, the bond purchase program. Um, and if they, you know, if they could, they could also back off. In, in other words, they could start selling bonds if uh, rates get too low and allow those rates to start moving back up. If, any, if anything, I think they'll do more buying than selling. So that is that is certainly a tool that they have available. It's not used much, uh, but it's there and there's support for it. So keeping even long-term rates low is, uh, I believe, also in the cards. Again, there's just too much at stake. Um, you know, debt levels are too high. They can't. They can't just uh, back off and 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 let things be. And how then can investors protect themselves? You mentioned precious metals earlier. Can you expand really on what um, investors can do at the moment? Sure. So, I mean, precious metals have proven themselves as hedges for millennia. Uh, silver and gold are the first ones that come to mind. They're both uh, monetary metals. Uh, they've been used as money for uh, thousands of years. Silver, in fact, even before gold. And um, I mean, you know, if you look at what's happened with those, if we look back even just in the past century, uh, back in 1913, when the Fed was established, silver was 60 cents an ounce. Uh, today, it's say $25. So if you look, if you calculate the compound rate of return on silver from 1913, you're actually looking at three point, I think it's 3.88% compounded over 108 years. So yes, that came with a lot of fluctuation, but I'd rather have an ounce of silver that cost me 60 cents back then, than have the 60 cents from back then, um, which would be worth essentially zero today. So, you know, these things ebb and flow. Um, Investors need to look at the kind of environment that we're in. Um, there's something called recency bias that uh, uh, I just kind of want to explain. It basically means that it's, uh, it's a fancy term, but it kind of means that, you know, people get uh, complacent and they start to see the future as close to the near past. They expect things to continue to be the way they have been recently. And things can change dramatically, suddenly, very quickly. And so we are certainly entering an environment where um, it's rising inflation. And in those environments, um, it's been it's been shown um, that uh, stocks and bonds do, do not do well. Stocks tend to, on average, uh, in a rising inflation rate, stocks tend to be down about 10%. Bonds tend to be down about 4% annually. And then you have uh, precious metals that uh, in fact, mining shares tend to go up about, I think it's 13%, precious metals up about 24%, and uh, commodities up about 26% in this kind of environment. So hard assets, uh, gold and silver in particular, are definitely the place to be with uh, this, this sort of uh, higher inflation and persistent high inflation environment. And how in general do the mining stocks versus the physical metal perform in this kind of environment? So... They, they actually tend to leverage the, the price of silver or gold. They tend to do quite well. Of course, you know, an investor is taking on risk by investing in a mining stock. So naturally, they need to be compensated for that risk. It doesn't mean that all these mining stocks will, will perform well. Uh, what we're looking at is, um, uh, you know, this this group of, of, um, of stocks as these stocks as a group and as a, a sector and how they perform. So typical leverage, if you look at what they've done in the past, you're looking typically at about maybe two to three times uh, what the silver or the gold price will will perform. So it's, it is a place to be. Um, it's interesting too that investors don't need to take a whole lot of risk. If you look at uh, gold mining shares, for example, gold producers and even some of the mid uh, mid sized gold uh, companies, producers or developers, um, but gold producers in particular, the top the top 50 gold producers um, are actually all now free uh, on average, all free cash flow 
uh, positive. Um, in about the last two years, uh, that's something that hasn't been the case for them for about the previous 25 years. And as a sector, um, they actually outperform net of inflation uh, nearly all other sectors. So, um, and, and then the yields, they pay dividends that are <laughs> much better than, than bonds or um, bank accounts these days. You can get very, uh, very easily, you can get yields on larger gold producers that will range anywhere from say 1% all the way up to even 4%. And that's with a set in a sector that's very undervalued. So your risk is low, your yields tend to be high, and you're investing in a sector that uh, has shown itself to perform well in this kind of environment. I know you've talked about in the past, like $300 silver and some price predictions on the metals. As we're talking also about inflation and the dollar being devalued, how meaningful is a price like $300 silver? Well, that's a very good point. And, you know, and that's Partly one of the reasons why my forecast or my my uh, target is is that high uh, is because you know if it's something that only happens four or five years down the road, it's going to be um, with even more devalued dollars. So it, in that sense, to me, it's a, a more re- it becomes a, a more realistic target because it will simply take that many more dollars to buy an ounce of silver. And, you know, I don't get to these targets to be um, sensational. Um, I actually, uh, I'm, I'm actually working on uh, writing uh, a book uh, called The Great Silver Bull that I plan to, to release early next year. And in the book, I talk about how um, I get to my target. And there are multiple ways that I, that I reach uh, $300. One of them is uh, if I look at how I, my, my forecast for gold. And so, uh, I think gold will ultimately reach at least $5,000. If you look at um, its high of last year in August, it was 2000. That's only two and a half times uh, its uh, its all-time high. And again, that's without taking account inflation or the fact that we haven't finished, uh, you know, we haven't reached uh, any kind of a peak in this bull market. So say $5,000 gold. And if you use a gold silver ratio uh, and then you use a low in the ratio, which happened in 1980 when silver peaked at $50. So that was a a ratio of 15. So gold silver ratio with gold at $5,000 gives you, I think it's $333 silver. So that's one way that I get to silver above $300. Um, If you look at inflation adjusted prices, uh, silver from, um, uh, silver at $50 in 1970, and you use realistic inflation numbers, um, which tend to run more like 7 to 8% over the last 40 or 50 years on an annual basis, uh, then you get again to the $300 range for silver. So again, um, you know, it sounds sensational, uh, but if you're looking a few years in the future, if you look at what silver has done in the past and how it relates to gold and inflation, I think it's actually a very realis- realistic target. So in your view, then, is silver a better play right now than gold? I think so. I mean, uh, you know, I think investors should really have both, be exposed to both um, and have some exposure, ideally, even to the the, uh, the mining uh, stocks in both uh, both for both metals. Uh, but, but yes, silver, I think, has the higher potential uh, from this point going forward. Uh, silver tends to outperform gold. We've seen that happen in all the previous bull markets. Silver um, started doing that last year. If you look at both the silver price and silver stocks in 2020, uh, silver outperformed gold almost two to one in 2020. And um, silver stocks... Uh, in uh, about July, August, the July, August period, when both both metals reached a peak, um, silver stocks started to outperform gold, and they've actually maintained that outperformance ever since then. So, as I say, silver tends to outperform gold in precious metals bull markets. It tends to do that in the later stages. And based on what I've seen happen last year for the stocks and for silver itself, uh, outperforming their gold peers, I think we're, we've we've entered that that stage, and that I think that will maintain itself for the next several years. And because of that, I think you know silver has so much more potential. There's something else to point out is that 
if you look at if you just compare gold and silver, you can compare like, compare silver with other metals as well. But gold is relatively close to its all time high. It's about 10 percent off. Silver is 50 percent below below its all time high, which it reached in 1980 and was close to again in 2011. And if you look at all the major metals, base metals, um, precious metals, um, platinum group metals, silver is actually the only one of all these metals that is still below its 1980 high. So it really has a lot of catching up to do. And, and as I say, it tends to do that in the later stages of the precious metals bull market. In your perspective, where we are right now in the precious metal bull market, we've seen a lot of consolidation really since August 2020. Um, does it look like to you that we're about to break out to the upside or we're going to see more consolidation from here? I would have to say it's, in my view, kind of difficult to say how close we are to breaking out. There is something that I um, that I uh, noticed very recently, and that is that the gold-silver ratio is back to 80 or just about 80. And if you look over the last sort of 50 years, uh, that's about the level at which it tends to peak. It has peaked higher, but many more times than not, it has peaked at 80 and then started to fall. So when it starts to fall, silver starts to out outpace gold. And it tends to mark when silver starts to, when the ratio starts to fall from 80 and uh, fall down, um, it tends to mark a point where both silver and gold do well with silver, of course, outpacing gold. So uh, on that basis, I think that we're certainly getting close to um, to a new uh, up leg. Uh, and, you know, it's been nearly maybe uh, 16 months or so since um, both metals have peaked in, in August of last year. So I think that uh, we've, we've spent plenty of time digesting. I think that uh, in the next few months, uh, it looks actually quite promising for both metals. Peter, we really appreciate your time today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers any last thoughts you had and where people can find you online? Like I say, silver is in a bull market. It's, it's I believe, a very powerful bull market. It's likely to be, I, I believe, the, the strongest bull market we've seen ever so far. And um, if, if uh, people are interested in knowing a little bit more about how to invest in, in silver and silver stocks, uh, as well as gold and gold stocks. I edit two investment newsletters, Gold Resource Investor and Silver Stock Investor. Uh, these are both found at resourcemaven.ca. And now uh, silverstockinvestor.com is the website for the silver newsletter and gold resource, go, sorry, goldresourceinvestor.com is the website for the gold uh, newsletter. And one little uh, sort of note on both of these, the silver newsletter uh, really covers the entire range. Um, I don't know of any other silver focused investment newsletter that does that. I cover the entire range of silver investments, everything from um, ETFs uh, all the way down to uh, the junior exploration stocks. So there really is, um, uh, the covers the entire risk um, spectrum. In the gold newsletter, I cover everything from um, gold ETFs all the way to sort of mid tiers and developers. So that's a lower risk approach to the gold sector, uh, but both certainly offer uh, plenty of leverage and upside to those to those metals. Fantastic. Well, Peter Kraut, thank you so much for your time. And once again, God bless. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. This is Dunnigan Kaiser, founder of Liberty and Finance. I'm now a licensed gold and silver broker for Miles Franklin. Call me directly for the physical gold and silver that you need at the best price with personalized private service from one of the oldest and best companies in the business. 31 years strong, A plus rated by the Better Business Bureau. Zero complaints, licensed and bonded. For physical delivery, vault storage, or precious metals IRAs, excellent prices, privacy, and confidentiality. Pay by check, money order, ACH, bank wire, or Bitcoin. Satisfaction guaranteed. For fastest service, just call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 888-81-LIBERTY. And either I or one of my sons and fellow brokers will call you back as soon as we can and understand your needs. 